Well, hey, good morning. Good morning. Glad you are here this morning. You know, as is often done from this stage, I will not make any snide comments about any other universities, but I will simply say, good morning, Old River, and gig em. Hey, uh, but I'm glad you're here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. I do have a couple of announcements for you before we jump into prayer time. First of all, don't forget our Harvest Fest is coming up, uh, coming up October 24th from 5 to 8 p.m. It will be at, at on our campus at Old River. It's going to be a great time of fellowship, and I'm sure there will be lots of food. We are Baptists, after all. So be there for that. Also, Field to Faith, which is a big community event for our students, will happen at the Star Wars Stadium this Wednesday night, starting at 6.30. You don't have to be a student to come. We would love for you to join us for worship. Tonight, there will be no uh, youth Bible study tonight or praise band practice at the church. And so students, y'all have the night off. We are going to jump into prayer time. I'm going to turn it over to my pastor. When we begin our prayer time, students, pipeline, if you would meet me on that far side, we will do that every Sunday morning. We will all pray together. So could you meet me on that side when prayer time starts? Pastor? All right. So a couple of things. One, we are definitely thankful. I am thankful. I don't want you to think I'm coming to worship with a heavy heart because of the A&M victory yesterday. Anybody who is playing Oklahoma or Alabama, I'm a fan of, at least for three hours while they're playing. So, gig them. There you go. So, there you go. That, that, I tell you, that hurt right there just a little. No, it's all good. But you know what? I'm telling you. It, uh, there's some life change happening. No, there's no life change for that. Um, so, uh, we are thankful that you're here. So, before we get up, we start coming forward for our prayer time. Last week, we had a, a young man, Zachary, brought up by his parents, six months old. I was going to have surgery this week to remove a cancerous tumor in, uh, in his cheek and in his jaw, around his jawbone, and miraculous healing was needed. This week, he had that surgery. They said there's a 50% chance that we will have a successful surgery, uh, and we think that if we can get 50% of uh, the what's there, we're doing okay. 90 would be a, a huge deal if we get 90%. They got done with the surgery. He does not have to have any type of follow-up. I'm telling you, he doesn't have to have any treatments. They're not thinking that he has to have any chemo. They said, we got every bit of tissue. And this is, this is the way that a doctor will explain something I'm about to tell you. The doctor said, what we thought was cancer cells around this was just swollen tissue because of the aggravation that was there. I will tell you something. They may have saw some cancer cells, and they probably were. But whenever God got involved, that changed. And so we're very thankful for that. And you cannot tell me that prayer does not change things. You can't tell me that prayer doesn't affect things here. Because prayer moves the hand that moves the world, right? So this morning, what do we want to happen here? We want change to happen in this room. We want God to move in this room. And it may be a physical need that someone has. It may be healing within a marriage that someone desires. It may be a, a problem that they think cannot be solved. I will tell you what is impossible for man is not impossible for God. And so this morning we're going to pray that God changes things in this service. That we walk out of this place. If you came in and you say, well, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing all right. You know what? We still, still need to pray even in those days. I know all you Aggies are like, this is the greatest day ever. We still need to pray. God, would you change my heart today through, your wor through the worship and through your word? Will you create in me a new, clean heart and renew 
a right spirit within me. Teach me today. And so this morning, I'm just going to ask as we have been, if you're ready, come forward. We're going to get around the altar. We're going to get up here and we're going to pray that God would move. We're going to pray for those marriages. We're going to pray for healing. We're going to pray that people who aren't just physically ill, that they're spiritually ill, that they would come to life today because not because of a spiritual healing of a cancer, but that God would take something dead and make them alive. This morning, church, pray out loud. Speak it out. Let people hear you pray. God can understand all of us praying at one time, but it encourages others to lift up the name. So pray with me that God would move in our service. Let's pray together. This morning as we focus in on 1 Peter again and how we are unmistakable, one thing I will tell you is what will make a church unmistakably his is when they lean on him through prayer in everything that we do. And so this morning as we lift up those prayer requests, as we ask God to move in this service, let ask you to cry out to him, God, help me to trust in you and not what I think. Dear Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for this opportunity. Lord, we give you honor and glory and praise because you deserve it all the time, no matter what. And Father, you have seen it through that a request from your people, from a mom and a dad who love their child, Father, you answered a prayer. And Father, you're always answering prayers. And Lord, we give you praise and honor for loving us the way that you do. And Father, forgive us when we push back against that love, against that discipline, against the answers that we don't like. But Father, always help us to remember that you're still answering. God, we thank you for that. We come before you this morning. We want to bring you honor in our worship. Lord, hear our praises this morning. We thank you for being a great, good, loving, excellent God. And we thank you for your son, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for the ability to come before the Father and Holy Spirit move in this place. Fill us this morning. Lord, we are humbled that you would even hear us. Thank you. We pray these things in the Holy Son's name and all the people said, Amen. Give the Lord worship this morning for what He's done.
remember the days of old.
prepared to see God do great things. Because we really believe that the expectation of God's people brings about God's movement. I, I'm one of those people that if we sit back and we say, okay, God, we're just going to wait on you, we miss the opportunity. And if we go back through Scripture, we see all through the process that Abraham didn't get to sit in Ur and decide what God was going to do or wait for what God was going to do. He had to leave his home to go. Noah had to begin building an ark before he ever knew what was to come. Moses would be out in the wilderness and have to say, I'll go before he would ever be used. This morning, are you prepared to be used? And do you want to see him move? Is that an expectation that you have? Yesterday, no one expected number one to fall. But I'll tell you this about our God, he's number one and he's not gonna fall. Whenever we do what he asks, he's not just the coach that stands on the sideline, he's the one that came and did everything for us and now we just get to walk in the footsteps of the one who is not just coaching but encouraging, not just encouraging but serving, not just serving, but he's loving us to a place that we will be unmistakable before others about whose we are. So I'm gonna ask you what I asked you last week. Do you know Jesus? Are you ready to meet with him through his word this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, we ask as we have this time together in your word. Lord, we thank you for the things in life that bring us temporary joy and happiness, and we thank you for these small things in life, whether it be a football game or a great meal with friends. Father, those bring some relief in the midst of a struggling world that we struggle through. But you are the only one that never fails. Your word is the only thing that will never change. You will always be the same. And because of that, we find not something that's temporary But Father, we find something that is eternal. Father, we thank you that we have your eternal word to learn from this morning. We pray that you would move in our hearts this morning as we read from it. We pray these things in your holy son's name, Jesus Christ, amen. Well, as you go ahead and turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter two, the second chapter of 1 Peter, I just want to remind you that today, if you have signed up for the blood drive, Appreciate it, brother. You got cords, you got cords. There we go. If you have signed up for the blood drive, that is happening at the church. And if you have not signed up, appreciate it, brother. If you have not signed up for the blood drive, you can show up this afternoon uh, before 4.30, and I imagine they'll have a place for you that you can be uh, fit in. And as you know, as always, there's always a need for that. And it's one way that we can serve our community. So that will happen at the church. And so just come up there anytime before 4.30 today if you're able to give and you desire to do that. Now, I told you a while ago that I was an Aggie fan for three hours. I will say the say gigum kind of hurt just a little, okay? It did. And and yesterday I was sitting there thinking about all the things that uh, that that go around uh, somebody like Alabama. There, there's a reason why everybody for the past few years has become a whoever fan when they're playing Alabama. It's because there's this certain trend that Alabama has. And I'm sorry, I keep messing with this thing. We're gonna see if it'll figure out where it's gonna sit in a minute. We'll figure it out, but I may touch it like a thousand times today. With Alabama, they have built a program that's not like many programs. They've built something there that is excellent. And it's, it's the way that they do things. And, and whenever somebody comes up against them, you realize that, man, we've gotta be excellent to the point that their excellence is. You have to meet their excellence to even stand a chance. And Oklahoma yesterday showed one of the reasons why they are an excellent team is because even whenever they were down, to the Longhorns, and I'm still, hook them, let's go. Sad to say today, but it happened. They didn't let the excellence that they knew they possessed 
get them in a place where they couldn't climb back out of it. And that's the reason why everybody wants to beat an Alabama. It's the reason why Texas in the past few years has wanted to beat Oklahoma is because there's this certain standard that they have of excellence. Well, in our lives, we have been called to proclaim something that is excellent. We've been called to do something that gives tribute to the excellent, but it's not our excellence, it's his. And whenever we get to this part of the text in, second, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2, we've talked about certain things. So let's just recap real quick. They'll be on the screen. When we first got into it, we realized that true believers are unmistakable because of what has been done for us and what is being done in and through us. That makes us unmistakable in a world. We have a, have a different thought process also. True believers understand the hope that we have is something that God planned and he prophesied that Jesus, the Son, purchased and provided and that the Holy Spirit points us to and builds us up in. That's what we have as believers. He points us to it and he purposes in the work of Christ and that's because we have an excellent hope. We have an unchanging hope. We have a living hope. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Church, we have a hope that is living. That's what brings excellence to the table. It's not what we have to offer. It's that we have an excellent Savior, an excellent God. And I will tell you this, as many teams try to match the excellent teams of today, which this year it looks like Georgia is going to be that excellent team. God has never asked us to match his excellence. He's asked us to walk in his way. You see, we can't do what Christ did because we're not excellent the way that Christ is excellent. We can't do what God does because we are not like God. But what we can do is learn from his word and we can understand that we were called now because of who he is and what he has provided and what Jesus has offered us, our living hope, that we need to, remember last week, we need to change clothes. We need, we need to make sure that we are walking with Christ. We need to build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. So today, as we continue walking through, we're gonna read verses nine through 12 today in the text. So 1 Peter chapter, chapter two, verses nine through 12 is where we'll be. So if you'll stand with me in honor of God's word, the words will be on the screen, say it with me. We stand in honor of God's word because it is his holy, infallible, inerrant word. It is completely true and trustworthy. It is necessary for the unbeliever to find salvation through Jesus Christ and for the believer to live a life of godliness. The Bible is God, the word of God or God's word. Church, do you believe that? And this is what verses, just very short four verses say this morning to us. It says, but you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. How many of you are glad that your eyes are open? That you see what the world is about, but your eyes have been opened to what Satan wants to do? How many of you are thankful for that? Once you were not a people, remember I told you to circle that last week, but now you are God's people and once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Dear Heavenly Father, we do come to you asking for you to speak through this. Lord, your word is yours, it's not ours. 
It's not any man's, and it's not any man that can put his own thought on your word, but it is only what you desire and what you have spoken, which is true. So, Father, we ask this morning that you would use this vessel to proclaim your words. And, Father, we, we pray that you would allow your word to penetrate. Holy Spirit, we ask for you to till the ground of our heart right now. Soften whatever is hard so the seed of the word can take root. Holy Spirit, bend and break us so you can mold, mend, and make us more like Jesus, our Savior. We pray these things in that holy name. Amen. So we've come to this place where Jesus is the cornerstone. And remember last week we talked about how churches oftentimes fall into a gimmicky process and we fall into a gimmicky process. We try to say, this is what we need in a church. Well, I will tell you, there's only one need in a church. And it's God, it's Jesus, it's the Holy Spirit. And you say, that's three things. Yeah, God is one, three in one. Remember, we talked about that last week, that we need to make sure we understand God's the creator, the uncaused cause. Jesus, his one and only son, who has always been God and always will be God himself, came and was the God-man, lived the life that we couldn't to purchase our salvation. So we have God, the Savior, Jesus, who now sits at the right hand of the Father, but the Holy Spirit came and has been given to us as a comforter and a guide. And so what's the one thing we need in our church is the Lord, period. It's the Lord's words. It's the Lord's presence. It's the Lord's influence. It's the Lord. And so we've seen all that, and Paul, uh, Peter keeps telling them, listen, you must build your life on the living hope, and men are gonna reject him. That's what we saw last week, that men rejected him, that he came to be what every person needed, but men will still reject him. And the Bible tells us in the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 28 and Psalm 118, and that he is the stone that the builder rejected, but to God was precious and holy. And so our lives have to be built around Christ, on Christ, and under Christ. He is not just the foundation, he is the walls that we should be trying to exist within, and he is also the capstone that finishes it all off, meaning that he is the Lord that is above all things. He is the name above all names. So now we are called to do what Christ has done. So now we know why we should walk in holiness. We should change clothes to look like him, and now we get to the place where we're actually called out to do it, but not for a terrible reason, a cheap reason, but because of what an excellent God has done for a sinful people. And that's what he opens up in verse nine is. He says, but you, talking about those who have trusted in Christ, and he names four things. We covered them very quickly last week, so we're just gonna run through them very quick this week. He says, you are a chosen Race. I want you to notice right there that that word race is a plural word. It is talking about we collectively together were the purchase of Christ. We together is what stands as the body of Christ. No individual person walks away saying, I am the body of Christ. The church in action is the body of Christ. So if you come to Old River and you say, why do y'all take church so seriously? Why is the membership so serious? Why do we do this? Because it's the church that's the body of Christ. And that's why we, why we meet together. That's why we understand that we need each other. But what we have is privileged by Jesus to go and serve Jesus, which leads us to the next statement that he says, you're a royal priesthood. Notice, that's also plural. We act on behalf of people as a church. Now, last week I referenced this and I wanna talk about it just a little bit again. We have such, we have clouded so much of Scripture that we have lost a basic teaching of Scripture that before surrender and salvation, so before surrender to Christ and salvation provided by Christ and deemed righteous by God himself, there is no access to God. Okay, now, you think, okay, well, yeah, that makes sense, but you gotta think of the ramifications, what that means. It means that my lost family members have no ability 
They stand defenseless and unable before God. It's a moment that I have to realize that what changes that in their life is the interaction of the church being this active body, the royal priesthood on their behalf. And you say, well, can I pray for their salvation and save them? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. It's saying that we are called as ones who have access to go before the Father and to do what priests were called to do, which were to go before the Lord on their behalf. You say, what does that mean? Last week we went before the Lord on someone's behalf. We together as a church said, listen, we're gonna pray. It means for my lost family members, it is my responsibility to pray for them. It is on me because I am part of the royal priesthood, the chosen people. I am one that has access to God, not because of what I've done, but because of what Christ has done. So when we come together for prayer meeting, like tonight, we come together to beckon the heart of God because we're called to be the royal priesthood. It also means that we are to be a people who are a holy nation. That's the third thing. Again, it's a plural word showing that it's us all working together. And what does that picture, what does that picture throw back to? It throws back to the Old Testament. That the, the people of Israel were supposed to be a picture of what a people living under God look like. So a great litmus test for any church, not just ours, but if they are a Bible-believing church, it should be if people looked at the people, the family of any church, do they look like they submit and they live under God? That's a question for us. If someone looks on from the outside and they say, listen, we wanna know what's different about you, do they see a difference in our church? And it's not just Oh, well, they're nice people. They're kind people. We want to know something. We get told all the time, man, we ran into someone that goes to your church. They were the kindest, most friendly person I've ever been around. I don't know who they ran into, but I was thankful for that testimony. I hear all the time, hey, I came to church. Somebody greeted me. I had 10 people greet me. I had people walking around talking to me, and I'm like, just leave me alone. I'm just here trying to figure out what's going on. And I'm like, that's great. That's awesome. But we don't need to be the friendliest church. It's good to be friendly. We, we don't need to be the most loving church. It's great to be loving. What we need to be is we need to be his church. And we need to be people who are unmistakable because we are his. And when people look in, they go, it's the way they live. It's the way they talk. It's the way they serve. It's everything about them. If there was a group of people who served a good God, this is what they would look like. And that's what church is supposed to be. So he says, you're a chosen race, privileged by Jesus to serve him, royal priesthood, and we are adopted by God and given access, which means that we should lift others up in prayer and we should be going to them and introducing them to God. We are his messengers to people. We are a holy nation, which means he has us as his possession, which is what he ends it up as, or ends that section with it, that we are his own possession, a people who he treasures as his own and he cares for. This morning, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, it's not because of Old River Baptist Church that he loves you. God loved you before you were ever even a believer. He loved you and treasured you. And I know that there are some people out there, it's like God doesn't need us. I will tell you something. No, he doesn't. And every person in this room understands what it means to be needed or what it means to be wanted. But I will tell you this, God loves us in such a pure way that he desired to have a relationship with us and he treasures each one of you individually. So no matter what you're walking through, and maybe you're a kid and you say, I don't know if my dad loves me, I wanna tell you something, you need to speak with your dad. 
but you also need to know if you believe in Jesus Christ that you have a heavenly father who treasures you. You may say, my, my spouse doesn't love me and I'm finding out every day more about what's going on when I'm not around. I wanna tell you something. You need to pray with your spouse. But you have a heavenly father who treasures you. You may be somebody who feels like, man, I'm just kind of past my prime in life and my kids are taking over and telling me what to do. I don't have a voice in a job anywhere anymore. I don't have a voice. I wanna tell you something. First, if you have the crown of silver, as the Bible talks about, we treasure you. You are wisdom in our church. Sometimes. Now I'm just joking. Because you would say, I don't know if I really have impact in this world. I want to tell you something. You have a heavenly father that says, I still will use you. And I treasure you. How do we know that? It's not because of anything we've done. It's because the Bible tells us that while we were yet sinners, he loved us so much that he sent Christ to die for us. He treasures us enough that he would do the unthinkable for us. So what does that mean we should do for him? That's where we're left. Yesterday, I imagine that there were some people trying to get their hands on the game ball from a Alabama A&M game. I remember whenever Barry Bonds hit his record-breaking home run, single season record, and there's people jumping out of kayaks. Y'all remember that? Diving for a ball, and I'm like, listen, you may drown so you can get a $8 baseball. But you wanna know what gave that ball worth? What gave Dan Quell's Little League uniform an $800,000 value at an auction? What makes memorabilia worthwhile? It's who's it owner is. If you do not believe you're treasured, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, your owner, as we have talked about, is God himself, and that makes you more valuable on this earth than you can ever imagine. And you have a role to play because of that. You have a mission because of that. And, and when I say you're more valuable, listen, the only way that people pass from death to life is that someone opens their eyes to the truth that they're lost. And the only people that know what being lost is are those who understands that they have been found. This week, we had a child return to his family after spending three weeks in the woods. I can tell you that kid knew he was lost, but he didn't know where to go. Rhonda sent me a, 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 a little, huh? Did I say weeks? I am so sorry, three days, not weeks. I would say that is a survival skill little kid right there. We will be getting that kid, Navy SEALs, line up. This kid's rolling. All right, so three days. Hey, three-year-old, three days in the woods, miraculous. And I'll tell you this, Rhonda sent me the, the little link to the news story, and I will tell you, this guy woke up, and he prayed, and he said, God, what am I supposed to do today? And he said, I just felt like the, the Lord was leading me to go look for this kid. You need to listen to this testimony. It's not flashy. It's not, oh, man, I walked up, and I was like, hey, I'm the guy. I've trailed everything. I got all the dogs, all the stuff. I can go get this kid. That's not how this worked. He said, I just felt like the Lord was telling me I need to go look. I was in my prayer time. I was having my cup of coffee. I decided to get up. I go out and I chased a few little rabbit trails, but there he was. And he found him. I can tell you this, that little boy at three years old right now knows what it means to be found. And for those of us who have had that moment where we realize, I'm lost, but I've been found. You've been found by the creator of the world, purchased by the blood of Jesus. You are treasured, and you have something to do.
You know what, I would get bored if I had nothing to do. Me and Jared talked about that yesterday as we were talking about some different things, and I said, I don't know what's gonna happen one day whenever I feel like I can't do anything else because I won't be able to handle it. You wanna know what? God's mission for his people never stops. So if you're for Cammie, if you're for, or if you're 20 times that and you're in your 80s and 90s, I wanna tell you something. You are still treasured, but you are still called to be doing what God has called you to do. You are still supposed to be serving in the church and serving God as a missionary outside the church. And so here's what we are called to do. He says, listen, that you would proclaim the excellencies of him who called you. What is our job? To talk about God. Some of you are really good about that, talking. Man, what if we just live that one verse, that one verse that we are to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us? What if we talked about it like we talked about the game yesterday? What if we talked about it like the deer is on the wall? What if we talked about it, about our home or about our kids? I mean, even just thinking those things and our kids' Little League trophies are temporal. As Shane Pruitt, who has come and shared with us before, and he'll be back sooner or later when I can get Shane to stop running so fast, he posted just the other day, there is a 1% chance that your child will ever stand before a professional recruiter but there's a 100% chance your child will stand before God. We talk about that 1% chance like it's the 100%. We talk about the 100% like it's the 1%. I tell you, God didn't die for just some of us. He died for all of us because he treasured people. And he desires for us to go. And so he says, we are to proclaim that excellent thing. We have been chosen to do this, to proclaim it. We are supposed to talk about him. Now, there's this quote, many of you will probably know it. It's from a book called From Good to Great, okay? And it's about a business, it's business actually. It's about why do businesses always just stay a good business and not a great business? And we can name some of those. If I say fast food restaurant, one name comes to your mind about who do things great. Say it, it's Christian chicken. We know what it is, okay? (laughs) <laughs> Cammy's over there like McDonald's. That's on the other side of the spectrum, okay? But here's the thing, we know who does it great. If we, talk about, if we talk about any specific food group, we know what it is, but this is what he said, the enemy of great is good. This week I was sitting in Barbara and Elmo's house for a few minutes, and he said that, and I said, hey, you gotta watch out, you're preaching my sermon. You see, we can talk about good God Hey, he's a good God. But listen, we need to be talking about the great God. Because here's the difference. Hey, you need to, why don't you come join us at church? Church is a good thing. Church will be good for your family. Church will be somewhere where you can connect with people. Okay, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. you're not about church, okay. Versus talking about the greatness of God. Hey, you wanna know what? You need God in your life. You must have God in your life. He's the greatest thing. He is excellent. He has done something for you that is unbelievable and you can't obtain it except through Jesus Christ. And you know what? Whenever you understand that you're lost and you need to be found, whenever you accept Christ, you're gonna want to be with a group of people who understands what it means to be lost and they've been found and that's the church. You don't just need to be at church because it's good for you. You need the church. And I'm not talking about Old River Baptist, and I'm not talking about First United Methodist. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is when you believe and trust in Christ, you want to meet with the people who understand how great the God of the universe really is. He is a good God, yes, but he is a great God who we're talking about excellencies, not good things. Hey, well, you know, Jesus, Jesus is somebody... 
This is what he did for you. No, that's not how we should talk to our friends about Jesus. You want to know the real proclamation of Christ? You're dead and you're going to hell. Wake up! And there's a great God who's given you the opportunity to wake up. There's a difference between how we talk about good things and great things. I can tell you right now, you talk about a steak and you talk about somewhere like Texas Roadhouse, love their bread, love their butter. Cammy, I know. But if you bring up steak, I got one steak in mind. It's the great steak. The great steak of Texas, if I can say it that way. Why? Because I talk about that steak different than I talk about any other steak. I talk about my grandmother's gumbo different than I talk about any of your gumbo, as good as it may be. But there's a difference in how you talk about something that you believe and you know to be great than what you just know to be good. Church, we're called to proclaim excellencies. The greatest thing of all time is that a lost world has an opportunity to have a relationship with God. Look at what he says in verse 10. He says, once you were not a people, but now you're God's people, and once you had not received mercy, but you have received mercy. Peter knew exactly what he was saying in this point. This is actually verses from Hosea. And so Hosea, if you remember the story, the people of Israel were wandering from God, and Hosea's wife, whose name's Gomer, becomes a prostitute by choice. And she runs away from him. And Hosea is called to go and get her out. Not just go get her and like wage war against the prostitution ring. He had to go and purchase her out. And then guess what happens? She does it again. But there's two children that he has with his prostituting wife who continue to leave him. And their names are Lo Rahama and Lo Ami. And you say, what does that matter? Well, because the girl's name, Lo Rahama, means the people who are not loved. And Lo Ami means not my people or not my nation. And so what Peter is saying is like, remember how we ran away from God and we were not loved and we were not his people? Now, through the blood of Jesus Christ, that excellent thing that we need to be talking about because we are the royal priesthood, we are the chosen people, we are his possession that he treasures because he has done this for us. We are his people. And if you read through Hosea, by the end of it, God is saying, hey, listen, you are my people and I do love you because our God is a redeeming God who loves. And so in turn, this is what verse seven, I mean, verse 11 says. It says, beloved. Now, stealing from a way that Lou Gigli, Louis Giglio used to say this back in the early 2000s, anytime you see beloved, it means truly loved is what the word actually means. Those who are truly loved. But if you take the be and the loved and you separate them, the word be is the verb I am. I am love. The covenant name of God is what? I am. So it's I am love. So every time you see beloved, those who are truly loved, I am loved you enough. God of the universe loved you enough that this is what we're called to. Peter says, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. Listen, we're back at it again. This world is not going to be fun. That's why he says exiles and sojourners. It's someone on a trip, but not just a, hey, I'm going to Disney and coming back. It's someone who's on a trip that they're trying to find their real home. They're out in the wilderness. We should think about our exile or our trip here more like Oregon Trail back in the 1990s. Y'all remember that game? Everybody died of dysentery or syphilis or something. And you'd find a kid that dehydrated. You're like, there's water. I mean, I, I, we crossed a river like 30 times because I couldn't go across it. But we should think along that line, though, that we're in the wilderness fighting for survival. And what are we to do while we're fighting for our survival? Proclaim the excellencies 
of our God who is great, not just good. What does that look like? Abstain from the passions of the flesh. Now listen to what it says. It doesn't say which wars against God. It says which wages war against your soul. Now let's just be very clear about what this is saying. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the beloved, the ones that I am loved, the truly loved, sinful patterns and behaviors wage war against you that other people will not recognize as harmful. The lost will never see the harmful things of sin affecting their lives. But a believer should see the harm. So it says it wars against our souls. So what does it look like? Keep your conduct among Gentiles honorable. Can I give you just one word of advice? If you can't stop typing, delete your Facebook. Honorable in all things. Your phone calls, your letters, the way that you speak to people at the office, the way you speak to your kids and your wife, the way that you speak to your husband, the way that you go about it, it has to be honorable. Why? Because there are going to be people who try to bring you down. That's what he says. He says, listen, you're traveling, and there's going to be all these people trying to bring you down. And it says, so when they see your good deeds, when they speak against you, and they say, oh, no, that's not who that really is. All they can do is see your good deeds and say, man, that's a good God that kid serves. That's a good God that they're following. He doesn't say you're not going to be accused. He doesn't say there's going to be an easy road. He doesn't say that there's not going to be broke down vehicles. And he doesn't say that you're going to have the greatest health. The greatest testimonies in my life have been people who have been walking through hell on earth but they are testifying about the excellencies of God. They're the ones who are crying out, I'm not gonna see my child again until I meet my maker who has provided a way and I will get to see my child again under the same light of God himself. It's the people who are saying, I'm separated right now from my loved one and I don't know when I'm gonna see him, but the goodness of God has raised my loved one to life and I will meet with them again. It's those who have said, I am walking through this flesh-eating, destructive cancer. However, my God says that even if he doesn't choose to heal me here, his excellence will heal me on the day that I enter heaven. It's, it's those who say, I don't know why I've been abandoned by my whole family because I believe in truth, yet I will walk in truth and proclaim and love a family that has disowned me. Man, if you can find him, find the testimony of Af Afshin Ziafat. He's a pastor in the Dallas area who grew up, I believe he's Iranian, I wanna make sure, but I believe he's Iranian, grew up accepted Christ because somebody handed him a Bible and he began to read the book of John. No influence besides the Bible itself. You wanna say the Bible doesn't change lives, I wanna tell you something, the Bible is where it all stands. That's where we get all truth. Completely disowned by his family, still reaching out, and I think some of his family has now become believers because of a young man reading the Gospel of John. But it says, you exiles, you sojourners. This is, the, this is the deal. It's gonna be war, and if you allow war in because of what you do, you have to put that to bed. You've changed your clothes, so keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they see it, they will look at God and go, man, that's a good God. This morning, I got a couple of questions for you. First, do you have access to God? You say, are you telling me that if I don't believe in Jesus as my Lord and Savior that my prayers hit a wall? That's exactly what I'm telling you. And the only prayer that changes that is the one when you say, Holy Spirit, you have told me the truth and I'm surrendering my entire life to you because Jesus paid for me. 
And if that's you this morning, I want you to know you can have uninterrupted service. Wouldn't it be great to have a cell phone that worked all the time? No drop calls. I want to tell you something. The Holy Spirit's connection to the Father doesn't ever waver, and you've got the clearest signal ever, but it requires your surrender to Jesus. So do you have access? This morning, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, in just a few moments, I'm gonna ask some of our deacons and prayer warriors, they're gonna get in that middle aisle. Some of them may be up here, some may be up here. Danny, I know for sure, is gonna be up here. And we're gonna have a time that if you don't have access to God, if you say, I've never trusted Jesus, my Lord and Savior, and you just told me that that's what's keeping me from God, you heard correctly, what are you gonna do with that? Do you have access? For some of us, maybe we need to think about, am I proclaiming his excellencies? Am I talking about him? And do I realize what he's done for me in such a way that it makes it? Yesterday, it doesn't matter if UT would have won a game or if Alabama would have won that game or if a and won that game. Next week, that game don't matter. In fact, today, it doesn't matter. And you know what? Yesterday when we were watching it and we were so involved, it took our mind off of the world that we are struggling through for a little while and that's why it mattered. But are we talking about him like we talk about our favorite thing? Because what we truly treasure is what we will talk about. Church, we don't need to be the friendliest church or the most loving church. We need to be his church evidenced by what we do and say maybe you just need to come and say would you pray for me that I would be bold about the excellent things of God because I want to I want to speak of God for who he truly is great and above all I'll also be standing over here I asked a deacon or two, I didn't pick any, but if you're a deacon and you want to, come right over here, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a time of prayer. If you need to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're saying, I know I need to do that. You may walk up and say, I did that. I just need to know what I'm, what's next? Come find one of our prayer warriors. Say, I need just to pray that God would make me more bold. Come find one of the prayer warriors. If you need healing, last week we had the opportunity to pray for healing, we saw God bring healing. You say, I haven't told anybody about this because I don't know what I should do. I'll tell you, there are people in this room that will tell you they wouldn't be here today unless God healed them. And I'm gonna be standing right over here and if you wanna be pray, prayed over for God to bring healing, I'm not telling you that he's going to do it. I'm not God, I don't have that answer. But what I can tell you is that he says, if you are sick, Go to the elders of the church and ask that you would be prayed for. And the Bible tells us that we are to set you apart and we're to pray for you. And we'll do that right over here. Why? Because that's what the church is supposed to do. We're supposed to talk about the great things of God. You want to know one of the great things of God is that he loves you enough to know about what you need. So it's more if that's you, I'm going to ask you to come meet me right over here and I'll pray for you. But church, let's stand together. And as Casey and our lead worshipers lead us in worship, this time is for you. Let's not waste what God has done.